And welcome back to High School Physics Explained. And today I would like to talk about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. To help us understand the principle, I want to give you a little scenario. So imagine this gentleman here standing in a room. And what we're going to do is we're going to place a ping pong ball in this room. And we're going to ask this gentleman to find it. But with one different feature. We're going to turn the light off. And now imagine you are this gentleman trying to find this ping pong ball. As you grope around the room, eventually you discover where the ping pong ball is because you accidentally kicked it. But it is no longer where you thought it was because the mere act of finding it causes it to be moved to another position. If that ping pong ball was moving, then similarly speaking, if you wanted to know how fast that ping pong ball is moving and I left the light off, the mere act of you groping around and touching it changes it. In essence, you cannot know for certain where that ping pong ball is or how fast it's going because the mere act of finding that ping pong ball causes it to change either in its position, in its speed or both. And that in essence is our step into Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So here's my little man and I ask the question, how do we know that this ball is actually in the room? Well, the way we can actually identify it, it's in the room is because we shed some light on it. But of course, when we shed some light on it, what we have is a photon of light hitting that ping pong ball and that photon then hits your eye. So what's happening is that this photon is interacting with the ping pong ball and because of the interaction, that is, it reflects, you know where the ping pong ball is. But what you already understand from the previous video with De Broglie is that a photon of light has some momentum. However, this momentum is so small relative to my ping pong ball that in essence, it doesn't change the ping pong ball's position at all. And so we can accurately determine where the ping pong ball is as long as it interacts with light and that it reflects the light. But what if I take away that ping pong ball and replace it with an electron? Now again, in order for me to see the electron and to know where it is, it has to interact with a photon of light. So that photon light strikes the electron, reflects and meets our eye. But now we have a problem. This photon of light has some momentum. And because this photon of light interacts with the electron, that photon itself causes the electron to change either in its position or its speed. In other words, the act of observing a particle changes its position and its momentum. So no longer can you be absolutely certain where it is because the mere act of looking at it causes it to change. Now, before we move on and talk a little bit more about the photon itself, I want you to understand an important term called resolution. And resolution is a way that we can see things clearly. And the way we see things clearly is because the thing that we use to observe something has a wavelength that is significantly smaller than the object we want to see. So as you look around the room, you see things, but those things are exceptionally larger than the wavelength of the light that we used to see things with. But as we start to see things smaller and smaller, we discover that we find we're having less clarity in the way we see things. So take, for example, a optical microscope and take, for example, we are interested in looking at bacteria. So here's my bacteria. Now, optical microscopes use light to observe our bacteria, but our bacteria, of course, are in the range of approximately one to two microns. And you can see that there is a set level of fuzziness around the bacteria, and that is simply because of an issue called resolution. You see, generally light microscopes can see up to about 2000 times magnification or a resolution of about 200 nanometers, which is 0.2 of a micrometer. Because the bacteria's uh, cell wall is at that resolution, at that level, they're going to appear a little bit fuzzy. 
Now, electron microscopes employ the whole idea that electrons themselves have a wavelength. But if you remember from the, my video on de Broglie, their wavelengths are in the X-ray region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so as a result, if we were to want to look at bacteria, you can see there is a lot greater resolution. And that is simply because my wavelength now is still significantly smaller than the bacteria themselves. As a result, the electron microscope can see up to 10 million times magnification or a resolution of about 50 picometers. That is 0 0.05 of a nanometer. So again, we can see how the resolution is affected by the size, the wavelength, and how that is used in and comparing what you're wanting to look at. So the closer you are to the size of the object in relative to the wavelength, the less clarity or less resolution you have to observe it. So now let's go back to our electron. And so here I have a photon of light. In this case, this photon is going to be yellow. So my wavelength is reasonably large. Now, my wavelength here will mean that I won't have great clarity at determining where the electron is. I have low resolution. But according to my formula here, with the de Broglie worked out, is that the momentum of this photon of light is actually quite small. Because the wavelength is larger, my momentum is actually smaller. And so even though I have less resolution, in other words, I know less about its position using my yellow photon of light, because of that, its momentum is less, which means if I want to observe it, remember the photon has to strike the electron and then reflect back to me or something that I'm measuring it with, that photon's momentum will be transferred to the electron. But because the momentum is low, I'm not going to affect my electron much. So although I have a lower ability to recognize where it is, I have a greater chance of knowing that the speed that it's going isn't going to be affected as much. But now let's say I want to look at it more closely and I want to know more accurately its position. So I'm going to use a wavelength that is smaller. So I've got a blue photon of light. But although that gives me greater resolution because now my wavelength is much smaller, due to the fact that the wavelength is now smaller, the momentum is larger which means that although I might get a, an increased ability to recognize where the electron is, I automatically decrease my ability to understand its momentum because the sheer act of observing causes the momentum to be transferred. And as a result, my electron will actually have a different speed because it's due to a momentum transfer. We're going to get my electron either speeding up or slowing down to what it was previously. Again, I'm changing its speed by the mere act of observing my electron. So now let's have a look at the uncertainty principle as Heisenberg stated it. So the first thing you need to understand is that it's error in position, and that's what this triangle means. In general terms, we've used delta as a symbol of understanding change in. But in the term of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, this is meaning the level of uncertainty. So the level of uncertainty of an object's position, that's which is x there, approximates to about a wavelength. So that's the first step. The second step is this, is that the level of uncertainty of an object's momentum at any given point approximates to Planck's constant divided by the wavelength. And if you can see, that's actually the wavelength formula. When you put those two together, you can get a formula that says this, the level of uncertainty in the position multiplied by the level of uncertainty in its momentum approximates to Planck's constant. Now, as you know, Planck's constant is a constant. It doesn't change. So automatically, this formula tells you that if you want to increase a level of certainty of the position, automatically you have a decrease of the ability to understand its momentum and vice versa, because the two will automatically combine to give you a constant, which is Planck's constant. In other words, you can never 
get absolute certainty of an object, momentum, and position at the same time. Now, in everyday life, you don't see this because, generally speaking, the numbers that we are dealing with, level uncertainties, aren't of the order of Planck's constant. But when we deal with really small particles, and in particular particles such as electrons, then this Heisenberg uncertainty principle comes into play. So the first question talks about a baseball, and we're asking what is the uncertainty in position, that's delta x, imposed by the uncertainty principle on a 150 gram baseball thrown at 42 meters per second, give or take one meters per second. So our uncertainty of x multiplied by the uncertainty of p must approximate to Planck's constant. If I rearrange that, I get that the uncertainty of x approximates to Planck's constant, which we know to be 6.626 by 10 to the power of negative 34. And we divide this by the uncertainty of momentum. Now it's the uncertainty of momentum, and that's mass times velocity. So it's 0.15 kilogram, of course SI units, multiplied by 1, which is our uncertainty in the speed. And so what we end up getting is 4.42 by 10 to the power of negative 33 meters. Now what is the significance of that? It's saying that when you look at a baseball, then your level of uncertainty of where it is, is in the order of 4.4 by 10 to negative 33 meters. Clearly, that is totally insignificant. So now let's have a look at the situation where we're involving ourselves with an electron. So again, delta x multiplied by delta p must approximate to Planck's constant. Now delta position is what we're looking for, so delta x, our uncertainty in position, must approximate to 6.626 by 10 to the power of negative 34, divided by, in this case, our uncertainty in momentum. Now uncertainty in momentum is mass times velocity, so it's 9.1 by 10 to the power of negative 31, which is a massive electron, and our uncertainty in velocity is at 0.1% of this. Now 0.1% is one thousandth of this. So therefore what we get is 1.10 by 10 to the power of 3. And when we calculate that out, we get 6.62 by 10 to the power of negative 7 meters. Now that seems like a small number. But considering that the average atom's size, as in diameter, is approximately 10 by 10 to the negative 10, then you can see that this value here is significantly larger than the size of the atom, of which the electron is only a part of. So as a result, this shows you a really large uncertainty of the position of an electron. I hope that has helped you understand the uncertainty principle. Please like and share if you found this useful. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.